All right, welcome to the Two Sons Podcast. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Back in town. It's been, what, three weeks since we did an yeah. episode? Yeah, it's, it's been kind of a crazy time. I was out of town five consecutive weeks. I think over that span, I was only in town like 10 days total. And then uh, my guy Luke here is a doctor. He's going through a little bit of a, a career change, which is good for us because with his new schedule, we should be able to do more shows. But that's still a few months away, but we're going to try to do as much as we can in the meantime. But as, plan on sometime around this fall, us being able to shift towards more episodes a week, which I'm really looking forward to because we have Thrawn, which we, uh, we're doing today. We're covering Thrawn. We're also going to be covering the Andor trailer, the new one. We have two additional Thrawn books we're going to be getting to. Uh, there's a High Republic book coming out yeah. in like in like a month and a half or something like that. Plenty to read. Andor starts on, uh, they pushed the release back to, you said what, like September 22nd, I, I think? I think the 21st. Yeah, yeah. September 21st. So we're going to have three episodes there. Then we're going to have more. I would anticipate they'll have either another show or a movie coming out this December. Uh, there was supposed to originally be like some sort of Rogue Squadron thing this December. I'm not sure if that ever materialized. Mm. That was a thing at one point. But either way... Um, uh, one of the big reasons why we're doing Thrawn too is I anticipate the Ahsoka um, uh, series to be coming out in early spring. Uh, just a lot of fun stuff. Luke and I yeah. uh, are uh, my wife's out of town and his wife's working this week, so we're going to do a rewatch of um, uh, the sequel trilogy, and uh, we have boo. some yeah, boo. <laughs> we have some ideas of like how we're going to kind of make some content out of that. That should be fun. Uh, yeah. Um, um, Lola's having breakfast behind us. Uh, it's a rainy day here in Tucson, and we're excited to talk some Star Wars. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's get let, let's start with the Andor trailer. So um, we had seen a kind of like a teaser trailer at some point a few mm -hmm. months ago, but this one was way more detailed. Revealed a bunch of different things. Mon Mothma kind of working her way around the Senate. We got Saw Gerrera, and we know that Andor at one point. Cassian Andor at one point is infiltrating the Empire. There's a lot of really interesting stuff. A lot of characters I noticed in that trailer. Yeah, too. there were at a least lot of like big characters. Fifteen to twenty new characters. So, right. what was your big takeaway from that trailer? Yeah, I think I think what we originally thought was going to happen is there's going to be stark contrast between um, the upper echelon of like Coruscant and and all the important people per se in the galaxy, and I think it's going to contrast sh very sharply with. Um, with, you know, the rebellion and the dregs of society, the dregs of society. <laughs> and essentially, I think what we're, we'll get into a little bit with Thrawn too, is there's only so much that the, the empire can push people before the people start to push back. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of mining too. There was like this, this wide, uh, scene where it looked like a bunch of strip mining was occurring. And, uh, that's a huge theme that we see in the Thrawn book. That's probably going to be a theme that we see here. And then um, that's that's a theme that we've seen elsewhere uh, because they're essentially trying to make their Death Star, right? Yeah. Actually, um, that's one of the big reasons why I wanted to start with the Andor trailer is like the connections between that and the Throne book are, are massive. And, right. And yeah, essentially like the dynamic at play there that I wanted to kind of touch on is the the concept of imperial politics because you mm -hmm. learn a ton of that in Thrawn because Thrawn essentially is rising up the imperial ranks and there are military elements to it because obviously he's a genius uh, military commander right but there's also this huge political element to it and he's constantly fighting against those elements and then uh people the, the powers that be that are constantly shifting things one way or another for their advantage right. and then like as you pointed out the uh, the ultimate goal of everything that the Empire is doing is to build the Death Star. Right. And uh, conceptually, and uh, Palpatine actually confirms this uh, in the Thrawn book, conceptually the idea is once this is constructed, fear will shut everyone up. Right. And, and, Which is and, what we see in A New Hope too, like your favorite uh, quote by Tarkin. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. And so, so essentially like what, what I'm really interested in for, for both of these, cause we have, I've like, I'm, I literally finished the Thrawn book last night and I'm going to be starting the second one uh, today because I'm just so excited to, to get into yeah. the rest of it. But between that and Andor, I'm just, this is, this is a concept of Star Wars that I've always really appreciated the depth of how society works, which right. is something that you don't get from the Marvels exactly. of the world. It's a uniquely Star Wars thing. You see it in other things, like Lord of the Rings is another example where they really take, uh, uh, Token really took the time to break down like the dynamics at play, the power dynamics at play in yeah. his little like realm. The and small things that go into running an empire. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And 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 so or the big things, I should say. Yeah, no, <laughs> rather large. Yeah, yeah, huge things. Yeah. And 
And so we're going to get into like a, a, a heavy spoilers version of this review later in the show. And I will announce that uh, for this beginning part, we're going to do the best we can to avoid those spoilers because I highly recommend you guys read this book. It's one of my favorite Star Wars books that I've read. A uh, couple of uh, specific things. Get the audio book. Because I believe they might, we haven't confirmed this yet, but we believe they might have got the, uh, uh, obtained the, the, or hired, excuse me, the voice actor from the Rebel series potentially to voice Thrawn. Right. So it, it has a very, like you, the audiobook is so good. It really sucks you into the Star Wars universe and it feels like it's a real piece of Star Wars content. So yeah. obviously the book is great. Luke actually originally read the book, mm-hmm. but you reread it this time with the audiobook. Well, and it's nice because, um, this isn't so much of a spoiler, but there's so many parts throughout the book where where uh, you read Thrawn's thoughts, where he's looking at like body positioning and like how people are moving their faces and how they're carrying their hands and if they look like they're embarrassed or if they look like they're confident, and and uh, it's really cool because when you read it. Um, it's a little bit, it's difficult to, to fully understand like that transition. But then when, when you're listening to the audiobook, it's very obvious when, when they're talking about Thrawn's thoughts. So it's, it's a really, yeah, they play that ominous, like uh, song in the background or they, yeah. they, he starts whispering, you know, right. one of the two. Yeah. Right. So, so I think the qual, I think almost as, specifically for this book, yeah. I would highly encourage the audiobook. What's also really cool too, in the audiobook, and I'm sure you saw this is um, throughout Rebels when we when we see Thrawn on screen, there's like this like pipe organ that plays, yeah. And then they <laughs> and then they play that like pipe organ too at certain parts where it's super cool. It's very reminiscent of Rebels and and the cartoon. Yeah, I thought you actually put that really well. So uh, if you're reading any other Star Wars book, it's more uh, the audio book is more just a matter of convenience, being able to listen to it while you're doing stuff like a yeah. multitasking thing. But specifically for the Thrawn books, it's also just a huge part of the experience. Oh, for sure. Uh, it, it, it was really really good. But so. This is, I'm not going to get too far into the spoilers, but there is a, because uh, uh, again, we're going to, it's impossible to completely avoid them in this discussion, but um, we'll save the details for later in the show. But at the end of the book, he has a conversation with his primary adversary, a person named Night Jason, Swan. that is a huge spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize com- for Jason. They have a Jason. conversation at some, they have a conversation, okay? <laughs> I'm not telling you any other details about anything other than the fact that oh they have a conversation. Oh my gosh, we just ruined so many people. <laughs> They're like, I think I'm going to read the book. Oh no. <laughs> Oh, well, now that the conversation uh, is... Apparently, I'm just going to listen to this podcast now. <laughs> Thanks, boys. But the... Uh, uh, so, in this conversation, um, you, you kind of come to terms with the fact that... Uh, and this is one of the big reasons why I like Thrawn. It's the same reason why I like a lot of the great villains, including the Sith. Because the Sith are not evil. They're just mm. dark. There's a huge distinction there. Evil is like... Right just doing bad things for the sake of doing bad things. Right. Like the Sith do bad things as a means to an end. Mm-hmm. It is part of their pursuit of power because of their philosophical approach to the way the galaxy should be ruled. Right. Essentially the one all powerful being should make the decisions for everybody and they should rule with law and order. That's right. That is, that is always the, the, the case. Like even Palpatine, you can tell at certain points, like, like he even says it during the book, like I have no reason to hurt those people. It's like, he's, he's not a, he's not just like a, you know, a sociopath. He's, he's a, he's dark, not evil. There's a huge difference. And, and, and Thrawn kind of falls into a similar category, although less stark. And the this Night Swan character obviously has a, a similar goal. Like Thrawn's goal is a better galaxy. Yeah. And uh, and obviously Night Swan's goal is a better galaxy. And they get into this conversation about how to do it. And obviously Night Swan wants to do it through upheaval. He wants mm-hmm. to overthrow the Empire. And Thrawn wants to do it by essentially making the Empire better law and order the, through uh, law and order yeah, yeah. And, and and one of the core we're philosophies in depth in spoilers right now everybody <laughs> <laughs> like we are knee deep in spoilers <laughs> i apologize this was this was better in plan this, than in practice yeah, this is not how we thought this is gonna go but i think we should proceed okay so <laughs> all right from this point on we're talking about spoilers you had your warning yeah, you've had your warning there's some spoilers in here so uh, uh but essentially uh there's a fundamental conflict between the two about the idea of unrest. Correct. Basically, Thrawn's concept is it's better to have a corrupt power that has absolute control and there yeah. is no unrest than it is to have 
uh, rebellion, which leads to unrest. Correct. So, sent, whereas like the the Night Swans approach is no, no, no. The rebellion is necessary to overthrow the corruption and to limit power. A- exactly. So, mm-hmm. so I I think that concept is a fun is the fundamental idea behind it's like the ethos or whatever you want to call it behind the Andor series which we're about to watch and this entire book series. well and that's what was so cool about it is is anybody who's seen rebels and probably most people have probably seen rebels before reading the book uh before reading thrawn's book i should say and uh throughout rebels you kind of do look at thrawn as this evil malicious character but then you see the inner workings of thrawn in this in this book and it's incredible to 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 feel your perception of Thrawn slowly change throughout the book. And that was one of my favorite parts about it is because you truly get the inside workings of his mind, which is incredible. And spoiler alert, we, we, at the end of the book, we know that he is actually still trying to just protect the Chiss. Mm -hmm. Essentially, like he essentially devotes his entire life to protecting the Chiss because he ends up working for the empire and he kind of falls into it. Um, but he's so dedicated to his people that he's willing to essentially live a completely altered life in order just to protect his people. And it's so cool. He has a profound sense of duty. He has a profound sense of duty. And he also understands that profound sense of duty, not just for the empire, not just for the Chiss, but then he also has that profound sense of duty when he's talking to uh, Night Swan, uh, which is his adversary, right? So um, it, it's super cool to see that dynamic and the respect that he has for anybody who he sees as carrying out duty. Yeah. The part you mentioned about Rebels is super interesting to me because I, so obviously I'm so into this now that like this, the, okay. <laughs> My wife gets up to go to the airport at 4 a.m. this morning. I have a horrible curse. Like, as soon as something disrupts me, I, I'm not going back to sleep. So right. I wake up at, like, 4, and uh, I, I finish the book, and I have, like, I have, like, an hour to kill. So I'm like, I'm just going to watch Rebels again. And I watch the first two episodes, and it's freaking incredible. A couple things. First of all, you know how they say Rebels and Clone Wars is a cartoon? Like, it's a cartoon for adults. Rebels literally starts with just murder like (laughs) stormtroopers are dying a lot like at one point like literally uh uh, i think it's 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 either ezra or kanan but uh one of them just like lobs a hand grenade at a stormtrooper and goes like bye bye and then they just like explode you're just like they're throwing people off of ledges towards the end at one point uh agent callus literally like kicks a stormtrooper into the abyss just just because he gave him a little bit of like because he asked like a harmless question and you're just you're just like wow like this is kind of intense anyway rebels is great though the point is the reason why i bring that up is the vibe you get from thrawn in rebels is uh, kind of evil, not necessarily evil, but very malicious. It, almost, it's, it's malicious. And the primary upside, the the likability in Thrawn is how much he respects his opponents. That yes. was that was and the how big much thing. he learns about them. Uh-huh. Exactly, where you get a much better feel for Thrawn's moral compass in this book, and, right. and that's what I really really appreciated about it is like the character development for Thrawn in this book is you learn about what makes him tick and what his ultimate goals are right. rather than in the Rebels he's just the servant of the Emperor who right. has a great deal of respect for his opponents you exactly know? like in, in Rebels he comes off as just malicious and willing to do anything in order to get the job done when that's not actually the case what, what Thrawn actually is is just incredibly efficient mm-hmm. so if he has a goal he's going to succeed at that goal whether five people are killed whether a hundred people are killed right but one of the big things too that they uh, put emphasis on especially towards the end of the book spoiler alert again is Thrawn actually does truly care for life yeah, he wants to is, limit casualties exactly yeah. and that's actually one of the reasons why he continues to want to stay in the empire and be in charge is because he knows that he would be best at getting results but also limiting casualties um, and that's actually i think one of the biggest driving forces for him to want to stay now i'm going to jump into a different part of this and i'm going to change track here a little bit um and i'm sure our viewers know who have read book two and three um, we have not by the way i just want to go out on a limb and say that Thrawn might end up being good, good. And I think that he might end up being a part of the rebels at some point because he obviously has a problem with the death star and he understands yeah. that there's uh, a huge issue there from a tact, uh, a tactful standpoint. Like he likes a mobile 
uh, navy that has many large ships that can spread their their reign if across the galaxy. more versatile, yeah. right? Way more versatile. Whereas he understands that a Death Star uh, is not versatile at all. Um, and then also, I think he truly is going to get worried about the fact that Palpatine is just going to have unlimited power, right? Meme quality right there, <laughs> unlimited power. So, anyways, um, so I and and not only that, but essentially, as as I see it, is Ezra and Thrawn have been marooned somewhere in hyperspace when they get pulled into hyperspace together at the season finale of Rebels. And I would not be surprised if during those conversations that Thrawn and Ezra obviously have, unless they died, which I don't think they did, um, I wouldn't be surprised if they came to terms on some stuff. And if Thrawn ends up saying, yeah, Ezra, I think the Empire is too powerful at this point. I want to help you guys. Okay, so it's a really interesting idea, and I, I'm going to disagree with you because this fundamental problem showed, showed up in this book, which was basically right as the Lothal stuff was beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm going to go. I'm going to give you a different prediction. Nice. My prediction is that he somehow, from the incident where he goes into hyperspace with Ezra, ends up returning to the Chiss Ascendancy in a position of major power. I see. And then what will end up happening is in the Ahsoka series, I think the Chiss Ascendancy will make a, a, a bigger appearance. But mm. I, I'm really int- I the the core idea that you're getting at I 100% agree with like Thrawn I believe at his core is a good man right and it, and actually this is a good time to get into another concept that you had brought up to me in passing a few days ago because um, there's a lot of characters in this book that we meet in greater detail right like we meet uh, Grand Moff Tarkin as somewhat of more of a political player rather right. than the military professional he's presented as in A New Hope. Uh, for instance, they basically straight up come out and say that he's like half military, half political right, in terms right. of his influence. We meet uh, this. We uh, Arinda Price, Governor Price, who from Rebels. I think is evil. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> she is a she murderer. Is actually, yeah, she's actually a sociopath. Right. Like her. Whole, but the book kind of goes through, and we'll get we'll get a little deeper into this later. But like, uh, it goes into the, the rise of Arinda Price from basically random civilian that's in a rich family to becoming the governor of Lothal and and the way that she basically backstabs her entire way to that position. But you also meet, um, you know, characters that, that, that we're familiar with that are are good. Wolf you learn, who was in clone wars and um, generally is presented as a military man who's a man of duty, very similar to Thrawn, not, not, not necessarily in agreement with everything the Empire does in terms of the morality, but committed to his job. And yeah, and it, it does into life it, uh, to limiting the loss of life, right? Yeah, no, mm-hmm. absolutely. And yeah. so, and 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 then you meet, you know, obviously Ensign uh, Vanto, who's yeah. uh, who's the one who follows Thrawn along, basically as his right hand man throughout the book. He's clearly a good man. Like this book draws a very gray. It, 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 it basically paints out a gray area in the entire Star Wars universe where you can be, you know, on the wrong side, but be the right guy. Yeah. Or, I mean, in the case of, you know, Saw Gerrera, be on the right side, but be the wrong kind of guy. Right. You know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. and that gray area of Star Wars is always going to be way more fascinating than the the really cut and dry stuff. So you had mentioned that you had a take on the Wolfie Lauren thing. I, w- I wanted to hear oh, that. Oh, essentially that's what it was. Oh, is, okay. is, you know, it's, it's so funny I because... Thunder, I'm any, sorry. No, you didn't. No. <laughs> no, but like as growing up as a kid, you're like, Empire, bad. <laughs> Like anybody who's a part of the empire equals bad. And, and it's really fun to really get into the weeds on this and be like, you know what? That's not really true. And it actually goes both ways too. Like we know that the rebellion is built up of smugglers who don't have completely clean histories. Right. I mean, um, solo is not perfect no. uh, by any stretch. Um, so, so, so there's other characters too that are on the rebel side that we know are not perfect. Sajurera perfect example i mean he's known for doing some radical crazy stuff which is actually why the gang in in rebels is kind of worried about him right they separate they straight up separate from yeah they're like oh saw's around so 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 yeah yeah it's cool to see that on on both aspects and and it's it's that's what we truly see in in real life like that is what we see on this world too like this is not just a star wars thing it's really cool to see how it relates like you know, like, like the United States government is not perfect by any stretch of the word. I don't think any government 
is perfect. And Thrawn says that in the book. He's like, yeah. every government is susceptible to that to some extent. Right, yeah. right. And and um, and it's, it's cool because it, it came clear to me, and you might have a different take on this, but it came clear to me at least that it didn't matter if they called themselves the Empire. It didn't matter what they called themselves. It didn't matter who was in charge. Thrawn essentially wanted to be in the upper ranks of whoever was in charge in order to help, like, allegate power and decrease corruption, right? So, I mean, it could have been, they call it anything other than the Empire, and Thrawn still probably would have tried to join them if he thought that it was even better than the alternative. Mm-hmm. So, and, and Thrawn's so, um, Thrawn is so calculated that, that I think he honestly sees the Empire as being obviously better because they're in charge and that limits disruption and death. But at some point, I could see how he would see the rebels. Oh, and that would be your shift. I said, right. Yeah, gotcha. and, and essentially, I think as soon as he discovered the... The Wookiee the, slaves. The Wookiee slaves. And as soon as he discovered the Death Star, I think his that, that, that graph of who's better, rebels or the Empire, I think started to shift a little bit. And I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see that shift even more and more and more. Because I know, uh, to my understanding, there's a lot of uh, there might be a lot of Vader in this upcoming book. So we might be able to see, you know, uh, Vader. Vader's evil to some extent, right? We know. Um, so he might start to get it, you know, these relationships with these big power players. Like I think Palpatine's evil, you know. Um, so so dark, I, I th- not evil. We established this, I'm dude. Actually, kidding. so that's what I, I okay. I, well, the, let's hear it. Let's hash Palpatine. It out. So. Uh, Palpatine will do anything in order to obtain power. So, so the idea, but for the ultimate goal of the Sith, though, right? For the ultimate, but I think the Sith are evil. Okay, that's yeah. Okay, oh, okay, yeah. So, I think the Sith are like Thanos. I think they have a worldview, and they will they will go. Their their moral compass is different in their attempts to get there, but I don't think they're necessarily evil. I want to hear, and you get What's, a little bit of that from Bane. I see that. But so they're willing to go to any length and they are uh, power hungry. And I think once you start to get power hungry, I think that's kind of when you start to to delve into like the side of evil. For example, like Arinda Price, there's there's we, we see her develop as a character. And in the beginning, she's pretty normal. Like, you know, it seems like she has somewhat of a moral compass. And at some point, she starts to give that up more and more. Because she got stabbed in the back a couple times, I think. She did, yeah. Yeah. So then, and then she kind of learns this. And at the end, she's like really like high on the fact that she's governor. Like essentially, she's like, anything that I've done, anything that I've done doesn't matter because I'm governor. And we know that Palpatine wants ultimate power, right? And I think that's evil, especially because of the way he goes about it. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. I, I get what you're saying. I, I guess I, I guess I'm draw, trying to draw a different line. Like I know you are a line, I, not not, but I guess what what I mean by evil is more like the uh, like the sociopath type ha- idea, like the idea of like a person that would simply hurt for the joy of hurting, like someone who goes over to like I don't know a bug on the ground and just smashes it for no good reason. yeah like, that's exactly but what essentially that bug is is like human lives like where they exactly. just go they just kill someone for no for no good reason you're right yeah. like palpatine doesn't go out of his way at least that i can remember he doesn't just go out of his way to just kill people right like granted he has no qualms with it if he has to mm-hmm. um but but i can see what you're saying like if he, if he doesn't see them as a, an obstacle i guess he doesn't go out of his way to kill them that's interesting so I want to get into uh, Thrawn and the Chiss ascendancy um, uh, to a greater extent, but I did want to hit on because uh, uh, I, I want to hit that specific question, like what Thrawn's ultimate goal is, what the Chiss ascendancy's ultimate right. goals. I want to get into that, but I wanted to hit one last thing on the corruption front uh, with the Empire because I thought this was a really interesting dynamic in the entire book. So. Um, uh, we'll get into this part deeper when we talk about the Chiss ascendancy. But Thrawn essentially gets picked up on a on a planet as a as like a, a castaway. So and, we think, and yeah. then and then he gets brought before the Emperor. More spoilers. Um, and he, yeah, yeah, we're gonna get into the heavy spoilers now. <laughs> so, uh, and he, <laughs> even though we didn't just tell you the end of the book, but, <laughs> <laughs> but he pulls the he pulls the Anakin Skywalker card to gain favor with uh, Palpatine to get a position in the Academy, uh, and and it, it basically goes through his rise through the ranks. Right. 
But one of the things that I thought was really interesting in, in, in this book is this concept of like the crossover between the military and, and, uh, Congress or politics, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And, and the, uh, um, the lack of a meritocracy in that regard. And they talk about this in the book a lot. And Vanto talks about this a lot. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Vanto, another, uh, a spoiler, but he talks about this a lot too. Like it's too often the person who's le- most qualified ends up losing to the person who's most connected. And, and you, and it's funny because this is like a real thing that happens everywhere in society. Right. It's like, how often do you hear where it's like all these, you know, it's like, oh, this politician, his son went to West Point. It's like, yeah, it's because he was able to make a phone call, you know, to right. a, a senator or whatever and get another letter of recommendation and then he gets this or right. like, or, or like, uh, same thing goes with just regular moving up the ranks in the military. If you, if you get in the, uh, connections with the right people, you can have advantages there. And you see that in, and it becomes an issue in any situation where, the wrong crop rises to the top. It's Correct. kind of a similar concept to what Bain was always worried about with the Sith. But at the end of the day, like one of the issues with this corruption is it just it does generally weaken society. And I think that is one of Thrawn's goals is to one of his goals. I don't think it's his main goal, which we'll get to in a minute. But I do believe that one of his goals there is like essentially to fix that specific problem. Yeah, I totally agree. The One of the scenes that's really cool in this book is when um, essentially Thrawn and Eli are jumped by a group of people who don't like Thrawn. And they don't like Thrawn because, number one, they feel threatened by him just because they know how smart he is. But then they also feel threatened by him because he's an alien. Um, and what's really cool is Thrawn ends up making it just a crap situation. And he ends up making a win-win for everybody involved. Like for example, um, uh, he somehow swings it to where the people who jumped him, he ends up getting them into like the starfighter pilot because he uh, was impressed by their tactics. Right. And which is so cool because like it just, it, that's one of the first areas where we just see how in depth and tactful Thrawn is like, he's willing to put his own ego aside and be like, you know what? These people are very, these people have qualities of a starfighter pilot. Like, let me suggest to my superior that they be moved elsewhere. And then what's cool about it too, is he doesn't do it for the the clout either. Uh, Eli bumps into one of those same guys that jumped them later on in the book. And the guy is just dumping on Eli. He's, yeah, he's just a total prick. Him. Yeah. <laughs> he's a total prick because he still has no clue that Thrawn essentially hooked him up. Um, so that was just like one of the, like the really cool instances where you just see like, man, like Thrawn has an amazing mind, which I've said to you too. It's actually Timothy Zahn that has an amazing mind. Yeah, exactly. You can come up with this, but, uh, side note, the way I'm viewing Timothy Zahn right now is, uh, almost Dave Filoni esque. Oh yeah. In he, 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 his, he gives a shit. Yeah. And his ability to understand the, the major happenings of, of the star Wars universe. No, I, I 100% agree. And I mean, I think I think in general, uh, uh, that's like one of the primary the primary goals of this book is to get you thoroughly informed as to what Thrawn's entire persona is. And right. I think that's specifically important because of what's coming right. next year, which I believe will be a really, really cool live action version of Thrawn that I'm very much in, looking in forward Ahsoka. to. In Ahsoka. In Ahsoka. I, I believe it'll be in Ahsoka. And, yeah. and Thrawn is... Because like uh, uh, the, the format of this book too follows something that is kind of a proven, um, a proven, um, you know, a concept that does well in terms of what fans like, and it's the Sherlock Holmes type of deal. This whole book is kind of like think of it as like the Star Wars version of Sherlock Holmes. Like every situation is like here's a problem, problem gets solved. After the fact, Thrawn basically lays out in detail how he oh, solves yeah, that's the true. problem. Yeah, which I didn't is think very about it that similar way. and. And, uh, in, I remember in Sherlock, you know, he'd, he'd walk in the Sherlock Holmes TV series with Benedict Cumberbatch in the Sherlock Holmes movie with, uh, movies with Robert Downey Jr. Mm-hmm. Similar theme, like he walks into a room and, you know, his eyes are always flashing around and like the, they do a good job of kind of expressing to the audience, all the little cues that he's picking up on right. and how it, it's a very, very similar, uh, type of vibe to that. And, and so it's a great between, analogy between that and just the interest and intrigue that surrounds Thrawn as a character, like I would not be surprised if we ended up having at one point in time a full-blown Thrawn series because it's be just incredible. that. I, I really didn't... This is this is somewhat in the weeds, this 
this book series. Oh, it, I think so. I think it's heavy in the weeds it's for your average for your average Star Wars fan. But I think it's important even for the average Star Wars fan with what with what is coming uh, with with yeah. what's coming in the future. So I wanted to switch gears a little bit. So okay. um, the Chiss Ascendancy, correct? I was vaguely familiar with them. Um, I wanted. I resisted any urges to go get on uh, Wikipedia and read up on the Chiss Ascendancy because I didn't want to spoil the next two books. So I stopped it. But there's this general idea. We find out at the end of the book um, that Thrawn was purposefully placed on this planet where the Empire found him by the Chiss Ascendancy because he actually lies to the Empire and tells them originally that he was a outcast of the Chiss Ascendancy. Because he was a little bit too radical for them. Because he was too radical for them. And that was a, a bluff. He actually is working with the Chiss Ascendancy, and this is basically one giant mission to infiltrate the Empire, essentially. So I have a, I have a couple of questions. First of all, do you know any more about the Chiss Ascendancy than I do? No, I don't think so. Me neither. Mm. And um, so before we skip on to Thrawn, the, I'm curious as to what the ultimate goal is of this entire endeavor, including Thrawn and the Chiss Ascendancy. And there's one specific reason why I wanted to mention that. At the end of the book, he straight up comes out and says to, I believe, to uh, um, to Night Swan, he says that that he believes there are greater threats, much greater threats in the galaxy than the Empire, which is creepy on a bunch of different levels. The galaxy is huge. The I galaxy guess. is huge, yes. Yeah. But I'm genuinely curious what those are because what we do know is that... Um, uh, the uh, uh, the Chiss Ascendancy is in the Unknown Regions. Yeah, now, that's if you, what I gather. If you remember, the Unknown Regions are this area of the galaxy that there are no mapped out hyperspace lanes. That's where the First Order went hiding. That's where uh, Palpatine transferred his consciousness. Uh, uh, boo. Uh, boo. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the unknown regions are, are are a huge portion of the galaxy that the that the Republic is ge- generally out of the loop on, and so we can. At the end of the book, uh, um, uh, Lieutenant Commander Vanto somehow gets clear of the Empire. Who knows how that happened? Right. Or unless it was part of the military endeavor from the Empire as like a joint effort. Mm. But he ends up running into the Chiss fleet. Well, uh, but not just like running into them, right? He, oh, he's, he's, he's visiting. The, he, he's, yeah. he's joining them. He's, he's joining some them. Thrawn, sort of, Thrawn yeah. essentially hooked him up with, uh, I don't know who it was, is a, a female Chiss character. Mm. Right. And, and, uh, Thrawn, I think I was like a little side hustle, not to take this away from you. Sorry, Jay. No, but good. As a side hustle, he was like, Hey, who would be good for the Chiss? And then he asked Night Swan to join and Night Swan's like, Hey, thanks, but no thanks. I got my people. And then, and he did actually say Night Swan had the same level of uh, competency as Vanto. Yeah. Remember, do you remember that part? Right. Well, and, and I would even argue, I, in my opinion, I think Night Swan has a way higher. Oh, of yeah. course. Yeah. I, when when than, he said that, I'm like, I'm like, would, would Night Swan take that as an insult? Right. You have the same level of competency as my inferior. I you know. know. Like, it's my I assistant. Know. <laughs> I, <laughs> but yeah, so I think it was just like a side hustle that, that um, Thrawn was doing. Yeah. I don't think that was, a, I think that was just one of, one of those added perks like, hey, Th- Thrawn, you know, uh, discovers or stumble upon, stumbles upon this this great military mind in the form of Vanto as well, and and just kind of recruits him. The, the, that specific dynamic is super interesting to me, though. So we have Thrawn, who represents a race of people called the Chiss, who are generally mythological right. in the in the uh, in the known galaxy, right. To the point where when they see them, they frequently mistake them for other aliens, mm-hmm. and no one seems to know much about the Chiss Ascendancy. The Chiss Ascendancy is in the unknown regions and is a militaristic society, and we can also infer that they view the Empire as more of a point of intrigue and somewhat of a, of a threat. So Potential threat. Yeah. So I, a I growing have a, threat. I, I have a theory, but I wanted to hear, what what do you think the ultimate goal is of the Chiss Ascendancy and, th- and their mission to send Thrawn into the Empire? Um, I think there's uh, two, I think there's two major goals that have equal weight, or not just two, but a, a few. Um, one of them, they need to keep tabs on the Empire. So, so now that Thrawn is a high-ranking, 
you know, military official, he's very much so able to do that. Um, and then I think number two is they want to not only keep tabs on, on the empire, but they want to direct the empire, uh, to a certain degree. And with Thrawn being as high as he is now, I think in a lot of ways he is able to direct the empire. And he also now has a personal relationship with Palpatine and Vader, uh, which also can direct the empire in a lot of ways too. So I think those are the two major goals. Yeah, I think I, uh, I think I almost one hundred percent agree. I have one slight tweak at the end. Like I, I absolutely believe it's about keeping tabs on the empire, like almost like as a spy, not in the spy, but more of like a, uh, like a reconnaissance type of mm-hmm. uh, deal, like an oh, because it's not exactly hidden. And, and by the way, I think Palpatine absolutely is aware of that. Yes, I think. It, I mean, this is the guy who uh, was the primary. Um, uh, architect of the grand plan right. to overthrow the Republic and the Jedi Order. So he's too smart to not see through that. Yeah. But I think but I think Palpatine's okay with it right. to a certain extent. I think where where I um think it gets interesting is uh Thrawn in his conversation with Night Swan basically comes out and says that he prefers the Empire's ideology over the Republic's ideology. Uh, essentially, like I, uh, he be- we talked about this earlier, but he believes that dissent, um, crushing dissent and leading with law and order th- leads to a lack of chaos, which is actually better for the totality of the of the of the living beings. Right, and and so I believe there's something to be said of uh, the Chiss, essentially viewing the Empire as a government that's more in line with their ideals and therefore a, a, a more feasible ally for them than the Republic was. Um, that said, like, we don't really know how powerful the Chiss Ascendancy is. And yeah, I, and we don't I'm, know how big or small they are. Exactly. We don't I know really what hope we they get want that. to do. Yeah. I, no, I, I, I would, would hope love so to too. learn more th- about that. I can, I, I foresee that we will learn mm. more about it. I'm, I'm sure we are. And I'm sure there's viewers right now who are just like screaming in their chairs like, oh, this is what happened. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? But we I don't mean, know. We, okay. Yeah, we don't don't know put yet. it and in the comments because I read them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, someone's just ruining our lives, just slipping comments in, like, and then they follow up with "I am evil," <laughs> <laughs> or "I'm dark, not evil." Tell Jason. Oh my gosh. Um, so before we get into like the nitty gritty of our notes, um, did you have any takeaways on the whole? Uh, um, any final takeaways on the uh, Arinda Price kind of rise to power? Oh yeah, she, she bothers me. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm, re- I'm excited to rewatch Rebels to get reacquainted with Price, but I remember she is kind of a she's a lot yeah she's she's not great she's not nice yeah she's <laughs> she's not nice um but uh, n- nonetheless a very interesting character one thing though that uh i was kind of struggling with and and i know you're watching rebels right now not struggling but contemplating i should say is um thrawn thrawn doesn't make things personal but the way that Thrawn goes about things and given the um, construct of his duties working for the Empire, um, the people who he affects negative, negatively do take it personally. So, and, and the prime example of that, I think, is Hera. And uh, she has her family's art, the Kalakori. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. So, so, and it's really interesting because... Um, when I was reading the book, I was specifically thinking of the instances where Thrawn does have Hera's family's uh, Kalakori. And I'm thinking like, man, that seems like ultra personal. And It's and, the cross thing, right? Yeah, if I where they like, it's like got like, a, it's got like dangling on pieces. for family members yeah. and mm-hmm. stuff. So, um, but then it kind of dawned on me. I'm like, well, like Hera's a part of the, the rebellion for an efficiency sake. Thrawn's trying to snuff out the rebellion and, and squash them. And Hera happens to be very high up in the rebellion, uh, or at least in areas surrounding the In Lothal. a specific rebel cell. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so on top of that, we know Thrawn's absurd interest in artwork. And he views that as like a living art almost. Uh, so, of course, he wants it. And if, he's probably thinking, well, if Hera's going to be gone... I might as well have it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, so that, that was kind of an interesting thing. And, and just something notable that I was pondering as I listened to the book and as I've also watched Rebels. I thought that was kind of a cool That's cool really interesting dynamic. because at one point in the book, he rescues art from a random 
governor who tries to steal he does. it. One of the many uh, Sherlock Holmes esque cases that he solves. Yeah. Um, there's yeah, it's like a governor who uh, is in charge of an alien species who somehow convinces them to declare independence to get the empire to attack the government building while he faked being in the government building but actually was in a ship off planet getting ready to steal all of the local right. culture's art and he actually saves the art and sends it back and sends it back which yeah. is super interesting because he is so like because art is obviously a huge part of this book it's a huge part of what makes Thrawn who he is but like it's interesting that he had the respect for that art in a way that he did not for Harris and Dula's art well which is interesting. but I, I see what you're saying there um, because he was saying it should you're, you're, when you're talking about respect you're saying the art should stay with the owner yeah. right and and i think i think he still has an utmost respect for it and this is what i was thinking about this is what i was like pondering but if if hera is like locked up or killed by the empire i think he's thinking like well i'm going to i'm going to take that for myself because hera is not going to enjoy it or that, that's that's kind of how i rationalized it at least so so those people who he saved or those those uh that group that he saved the artwork for very much so are still intact and i think that's why he he wanted to give it back to them i think mm -hmm. so how do you think the death star is going to play in the in the next couple of books so backstory throughout the book there are these uh basically a consistent theme the empire is snatching up all of these mines mm -hmm. and they're buying up all of these old clone wars parts that have a, a certain metal called dunium in them which is essentially like ship plating and um, they're shipping it all to it, Th Thrawn essentially uncovers this secret empire scheme to construct the Death Star, then has the balls to look Emperor Palpatine in the face and be like, tell me about the Death Star, right. dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and it's kind of, that's that. Well, that's an interesting dynamic because I uh, Thrawn obviously knows that the Emperor is very powerful. But I don't know if he realizes just, just how, how powerful. powerful yeah. Like I don't really realize. I don't even. I don't think Thrawn realizes what type of water he was treading in. Oh, yeah. When he brought that up. And wait, wait, wait. Do we real? Do we re That's that's an interesting concept. That's why I Thrawn, think he's going to change. Thrawn, who never misses anything. Yeah. Is there any chance he would not realize that Palpatine ha is a Force user? He. I think he probably suspects it. And then, um, can you imagine how in influential it would be on any being especially Thrawn to be in a room with Palpatine and then have Vader come in oh dude and then it, like any person in that room would be like huh this is extraordinary presumably <laughs> like, like, like he's, this is not normal <laughs> yeah well presumably he's <sighs> like it would pro the hierarchy of the entire emperor empire would be Emperor Palpatine Darth Vader Kind of, uh, and there's a heavy insinuation in the New Hope that uh, Darth Vader is on similar footing to Grand Moff Tarkin. Yes, as far as hier hierarchy. Yeah, hierarchy. and then Thrawn presumably is the next step down from there. Yeah. So, and then I think there's going to be some in investigational work, and I, I'm sure Thrawn's going to figure out that you know Vader is is um, is Anakin because we know that Thrawn and Anakin meet each other during Clone Wars. I believe on the cover of the second book, Thrawn's with Vader, isn't mm -hmm. he? Yeah. yeah. So I would anticipate a lot of that. I, as a matter of fact, I did go to Wikipedia and barely start to read Thrawn's page before I realized that spoilers were going to start coming up. I see. Because I couldn't remember if Thrawn, because you know how like you sometimes will, like I'm trying to think of an example, like uh, you'd see like, a, oh, it's, it's baby Boba Fett in Clone Wars doing some nefarious stuff. Uh -huh. And I was like, I was trying to remember, I was like, was there any moment in Clone Wars where, where Thrawn showed up as like, a, uh, and I don't, I don't think, think so. And I don't think so. No, so yeah, I don't think I, so. I could, but I wanted to double check. So I went to his page and, and then like, I, 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 cause they keep referencing this altercation, not altercation, but this uh, like cooperative effort between Anakin Skywalker yeah. and Thrawn, which was where they first met and it happened during the Clone Wars. So right. I'm like, okay, did that was that in a Clone Wars episode? So I started looking it up and they said on the Wikipedia page, right before I stopped reading, they said that they get into that specific uh, uh, situation in detail in the second book. Oh, I see. So I, I wonder if it's going to be flashback heavy. Oh, I, uh, I wonder. Yeah. Wh which we'll see. But bottom line though, I do think we're going to learn a lot about Thrawn's uh, uh, ultimate uh, finish line or goals or so mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it from these next books because he is he straight up as Luke mentioned earlier he straight up tells Emperor Palpatine like don't you think you'd be better served to have 
a lot more capital ships so that right. you have the flexibility to cover lots a more of ground. Flexible and, Navy. And then Palpatine goes, you don't need to cover lots of ground if everyone's terrified of this giant planet killer, you know, that which kind of again. Thing. So then at this point, Thrawn's now disagreeing with who's in charge and who's going to remain in charge. And, and that's honestly why I think Thrawn changes. Okay. I like, I honestly, you heard it here first folks. <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting. Did, uh, what else did you have in your notes? No, that was it. That was all my big, those are all my big things. Yeah. I don't have anything huge after that. I'm just really excited for this, this upcoming book. I'm going to start, I'm going to start it on my way to work. Yeah. Okay. I had, yeah, I, I think we got to just about everything. Yeah. We're going to, I want to start, um, the second Thrawn book right away. And uh, what we'll do is next week on Wednesday, we'll hit, um, uh, at least whatever portion of the second book that we get into. And then what, what our plan is, is we're just going to basically set up the camera while we rewatch one of these star Wars movies. Uh, I think we're doing Thursday night. And, uh, and I'll just kind of cut through all the footage and, and see what kind of quality stuff. It'll either be a podcast or it'll be some social media stuff, but cut, Luke and I just have a, there we're due for just the complete and utter destruction of the sequel trilogy. <laughs> like it just needs to happen. You know, there, we do this thing in basketball. Uh, what, I cover the NBA for a living on, uh, um, for the volume and like during the summer, like for instance, yesterday we did player rankings. And so I did 25 through 21 and it's like, it's total filler, but it's also like fun and kind of like just needs to be done. It kind of feels like part of the process. Like, look, we're, we're, Andor doesn't come out for another month and a half. Um, you know, there, there, we don't have any legitimately uh, important Star Wars content coming out o- over the next six weeks. So it's like, now is a great time to just, just, dive just, just head first. Yeah, just dive into a complete and utter tear down of the sequel uh, trilogy, which I think, which I think would be fun. But, uh, yep. That is all we have for today. As always, we appreciate your guys' support. Don't forget to follow all of our social media pro- profiles. Subscribe to the to the um, to the Two Sons Podcast YouTube channel and the podcast feeds and everything along those lines. And we will see you guys uh, in a couple of days with some content around the sequel trilogy. Thanks a lot.